I would like to begin by saying how sorry I am about what happened to Nancy Kerrigan. Now imagine. Imagine yourself as a 25-year-old Olympic level figure skater and you're getting ready to skate in the US Women's Championship, but against a 24-year-old skating prodigy. While preparing for one of the most important events in your life, you step out of the skating rink. Suddenly, you are attacked by an unidentified man, leaving you with a career-ending injury. Now, put yourself in the 24-year-old prodigy's shoes. With the media in a frenzy, they are trying to find reason. No, actually, they're just trying to find someone to blame, but who? Actually, that would be you. Within a blink of an eye, all of a sudden you find yourself with thousands of fingers pointed at you. This is a story of Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan. He is under investigation by Olympic and skating officials. Please, will you go away? Nancy Kerrigan was a figure skating superstar, one of the best America has seen in the 90s. However, her rise to fame wasn't exactly easy, climbing the ranks, eventually being inducted into the 2004 Figure Skating Hall of Fame. But what exactly had she accomplished during her career? Huh, well, let's see. At just 21 years old, during the 1991 US Figure Skating Championships, she claimed herself a bronze medal. Then, during the 1992 Olympics, she claimed herself another bronze medal. However, just right after the Olympics, she won silver in the 1992 World Championships. During this time, she was basically on top of the world, getting sponsorships from the likes of Campbell Soup, Evian, Seiko, and even Reebok. However, a few years later, January 6, 1994, a figure skating scandal rocked the sports world. A brutal assault that would forever change her life. An unknown man swung a baton at her right knee. As with any story, Kerrigan's tale began long before the notorious incident of 1994. It all started in the frost-kissed rinks of America, where another young woman that went by the name of Tanya Harding also started her ice skating journey. These two gifted young women pursued their shared dream of figure skating glory. From the start, Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan couldn't have been more different. But who was Tanya? Tanya was a blue-collar dynamo from the rugged terrains of Portland, Oregon, living in a trailer park home with her alcoholic and abusive mother and also a sick father. Tanya's mother worked multiple jobs just to keep their family afloat, in hopes of Tanya's ice skating career would be the jackpot that would change their lives. Tanya learned to skate on homemade ice rinks her mother made in their backyard. She contained a powerful and athletic style marked by groundbreaking triple axles, which starkly contrasted Kerrigan's traditional grace and elegance. Hailing from Massachusetts, Kerrigan embodied the quintessential ice princess, nurtured by a supportive middle-class family. Their contrasting upbringings and styles set the stage for an on-ice rivalry that was as much a class war as a sporting competition. Meet Jeff Galuli. Jeff Galuli was Tanya's husband at the time, but he wasn't your Jimmy Prince Charming. Not at all, actually. And the relationship isn't perfect either. But after some time, Jeff and Tanya's relationship started to crumble, and they had become separated. And that's when she started to date an old friend named Mike. I mean, who wouldn't date Mike? Mike Plisco was the total opposite of Jeff. Stable job in construction, calm, cool, and collected. And during this time in 1991, Tanya was at the top of her game. 1991. Harding made history as the first American woman to land a triple axel in competition. 1993. Kerrigan steadily climbed the ranks with her exquisite artistry and technical prowess, winning the US Championships. These victories marked them as the faces of US women's figure skating. Then, in 1994, the Golden Girls were destined to clash in the US Figure Skating Championships. In the media's gaze, the Harding-Kerrigan rivalry was irresistible. They painted Harding as the scrappy underdog of a challenging upbringing to defy the odds. But on the other side of the coin, Kerrigan, America's darling, the elegant ice queen with a heartwarming smile. The media's dramatization of their rivalry only heightened the tension transforming the rink into an arena, the skaters into gladiators, and their performances into battles for supremacy. But let's rewind back during the time Tanya was dating Mike Pliska. 
She was on top of the world, skating the best she's ever had, and receiving fame and fortune. All of this would come at the expense of their relationship. But waiting on the sidelines would be... <laughs> yes, you guessed it, Jeff Galuli. And eventually they get back together. Although this would come at a cost for a different expense this time, her skating. Tanya would eventually start to smoke more often, gain more weight, and stop landing her triple axle. But most importantly, she failed to medal at the 1992 Olympics while her rival Nancy Kerrigan did. Because of this, eyes and sponsorship started to head Nancy Kerrigan's way. November 1993, Portland, Oregon, Olympic Regional Qualifications. This was Tanya's chance to make the 1994 Olympic team in front of her home crowd. But something wild happens during the warm-ups. An anonymous man calls the ice skating rink and threatens to shoot Tanya Harding in the head if she skated on the ice. This would result in the officials cancelling the competition, giving Tanya Harding an exemption. Now, this is where the story really begins. Jeff meets up with his old friend Sean Eckhart. This is when Jeff tells Sean about the possible fame and fortune Tanya would receive if she can beat Nancy Kerrigan at the 1994 Olympics. And they came up with a plan. A plan not to only win the Olympics, but to perhaps end Nancy Kerrigan's career by damaging her right leg, her landing leg. Sean hires two of his bodybuilder friends to pull off the plan, Shane Stant and his uncle. But to pull off this heinous act, they needed to know where Kerrigan would be. So, they called up a skating journalist to find out where Kerrigan would be practicing, which was then written down on a piece of paper, Tony Kent Arena. Then another call was made to the Tony Kent Arena to find out what time she would be practicing. But when it was time to execute the plan, Shane Stant wasn't able to find Kerrigan, which led to plan B. January 6th, 1994. The world of figure skating usually thought with the words grace and elegance was quickly flipped over on its head. The setting, Kobo Arena, where? Detroit, Michigan. Just a day before the US Figure Skating Championships, the usually bubbly and energetic Nancy Kerrigan had just stepped off the ice from a practice session when an unidentified man swung a baton at her right knee, a direct hit that sent her sprawling onto the floor. Footage of Kerrigan's painful cries echoed around the world. The shocking attack on a beloved figure skater elicited an outpouring of sympathy for Kerrigan and condemnation for her unknown assailant. The media was on this story like vultures, each new development adding more and more fuel to the fire. The 1994 US Figure Skating Championships, which occurred only a day after the attack, became a spectacle of suspense. The absence of Nancy Kerrigan was definitely felt. Her withdrawal from the competition created a void that her rival, Tanya Harding, would go on to fill with a controversial triumph. Harding, already at the center of all the speculation due to her obvious connection with Kerrigan's attack, delivered an amazing performance and victory. But something wasn't right. The public and media found themselves torn between celebrating a national champion and the suspicions of an unfolding scandal. During investigation, a trail of breadcrumbs quickly led the FBI to the attackers. The man with the baton was identified as Shane Stant, but he was merely the hired muscle. Jeff Galuli, Harding's ex-husband, and her bodyguard Sean Eckhart were the masterminds behind all this. Now, put yourself in this situation. Your rival's husband and your rival's bodyguard created a plan to ruin your skating career. It's only natural that you would think that your rival put them up to this. And that was the media's narrative. The connection to Harding was a jolt to the figure skating community and the public. Had America's scrappy underdog been involved in sabotaging her biggest competitor? The spotlight was on Harding, who constantly denied involvement, but the story and the motive were too strong to not think she did it. With all this happening, this left many people suspicious about the death threat that happened during the Olympic regional qualifiers, which led to the feds receiving tips about the phone call and calling Jeff and Tanya for an interrogation separately. But both firmly denied any connection to the attack. However, it wouldn't last long until someone cracked. It took just eight days for Stant, Smith, and Eckert to confess everything they knew Yes. Including Jeff and Tanya's role in the whole thing. And not even two weeks later, Jeff cracks. Jeff Galuli couldn't handle the heat. And he tells the FBI that Tanya was in on the whole thing from the very beginning. But without any more evidence, the FBI can't make an arrest. 
With the attackers apprehended and their connection to Harding established, all eyes turned to the figure skater herself. The question on everyone's mind, did Harding know about the plan to take out Kerrigan? The Galuli Tapes Now, the Galuli Tapes were extremely important for the ongoing investigation. These were a series of telephone conversations secretly recorded by Jeff Galuli after the attack in an attempt to demonstrate Harding's complicity in the plan. The tape's veracity and content stirred controversy, leading to favored debates about their legality and admissibility. And to make things even worse, remember when they called the Tony Ken Arena and wrote it down on a piece of paper? January 31st, Portland restaurant owner Kathy Peterson sifts through trash that's been illegally dumped on her property. This particular day, and I opened up the first bag of trash um, and going through it looking for an envelope or a name or something. And so what I found in the garbage was a commuter ticket out of Detroit. I found an envelope with all this doodling with a Tony Cantarina, things that pertain to Nancy Kerrigan's practice schedule, and a Skaters Association um, check receipt made out to Tanya Harding. The envelope was turned over to the FBI, and they had a handwriting expert analyze it. The side that has Tony Cantarina on it, that's the side with Tanya's writing. However, in the upper portion, I recall very distinctly three entries that had to do with dollar figures and those were all written by Jeff Galuli. Interestingly, the dollar figures all totaled up to the same amount of money that was paid to the individuals who went out and hit Nancy Kerrigan on the knee. Okay, so these three men, Jeff Galuli, Sean Eckhart, and Shane Stant, were under intense scrutiny. Galuli, Harding's ex-husband, was said to be the mastermind behind all this to secure Harding's Olympic dreams. Sean Eckhart, Harding's bodyguard, was characterized as a wannabe spy living out a crime drama fantasy. Shane Stant, the actual assailant, was hired just for a promise of quick money. Each had their version of the events, definitely not making anything more easier. The legal implications of the attack were growing. Galuli, Eckhart, Stant, and getaway driver Derek Smith were all prosecuted and received prison sentences. Now, what about Harding? The legal process surrounding Harding was more convoluted. She admitted to hindering the investigation by failing to report her knowledge of the attack and she continued to maintain that she had no prior knowledge of the plan. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am responsible, however, for failing for failing to report things I learned about the assault when I returned home from nationals. The trials became media spectacles, further highlighting the convergence of sports, scandal, and the justice system as the world grappled with the question of Tanya Harding's innocence or guilt. With the legal proceedings looming over the athletes a short month after the incident, the stage was set for an Olympics like no other. The world watched, holding their breath as Harding and Kerrigan arrived in Lillehammer, Norway for the Winter Games. The tension in the air was palpable. These were not just games anymore. <laughs> oh no no no. They had become a battleground of reputation, resilience, and redemption. Kerrigan, the victim turned survivor, took to the ice with an unmatched determination. The physical scars of her attack had healed, but the emotional ones remained. Her performances were stunning, a testament to her resolve. She skated with precision, grace, and power, delivering what many believe were the best performances of her career. In the end, she claimed the silver medal, which is pretty good after all she went through. Harding's Olympic experience, in contrast, was tainted by controversy and disaster. From a botched practice session to the infamous broken lace incident during her short program, she struggled throughout. Her pleas to the judges for a restart due to the lacing issue added more drama to an already tension-filled event. Ultimately, she finished in 8th place, a disappointing end to a tumultuous journey. But the drama was far from over in the aftermath of the Winter Olympics. Attention shifted from the ice rink to the courtroom as Tanya Harding faced trial. She pleaded guilty to hindering the prosecution, acknowledging that she had been aware of the attack after it occurred but had failed to come forward immediately. The plea deal brought a $100,000 fine, 3 years of probation, and 500 hours of community service. However, the most severe consequence has yet to come. 
In June 1994, the US Figure Skating Association banned Harding for life, stripping her of her 1994 US national title, which she won the day after Nancy Kerrigan was attacked. In contrast, Nancy Kerrigan emerged from the ordeal, her reputation largely intact. Kerrigan continued to skate professionally, even participating in exhibitions and ice shows. She leveraged her high profile into several endorsements and TV appearances, including a stint on Dancing with the Stars. However, she largely retreated from the public eye, choosing a more private life away from the harsh media spotlight. The Harding Kerrigan scandal raises complex questions about truth, blame, and redemption. Was Harding a villain, a victim, or both?